I'm here to um, introduce our next speaker, who is Ellen Comp. And uh, I really like reading these bios, especially this one, because Ellen has <coughs> one of the most complete cannabis bios for any woman I know. So I'm, I'm going to read this in kind of a, a prose form. This is, this is, these are some of the things that you can do when you've been a cannabis activist for more than 25 years. Ellen Cobb, her, of course she has a handle, Nola Evangelista, AKA Nola Evangelista, is Deputy Director of California Normal, and she's been a hemp and marijuana activist since 1991. She began in Los Angeles, where she helped plan quarterly hemp rallies and volunteered for LA Normal after being elected to the California Normal Board of Directors in 1992. She edited the ninth edition of The Emperor Wears No Clothes by Jack Herrera, which is a classic book, and was a volunteer petitioner for the California Hemp Initiative in 1993 and 1994 and Proposition 215 in 1995, which of course gave us medical cannabis. She worked as an advertising salesperson and editor at Hemp World Magazine, the first trade journal for the hemp industry. From 1997 to 1998, Ellen served on the San Luis Obispo County Drug and Alcohol Advisory Board, which advises the County Drug and Alcohol Services Agency on community standards and practices. She also co-founded the 215 Reporter, the first journal covering California's medical marijuana law and its aftermath. In 2001, Ellen developed a website to assist attorneys in medical marijuana defenses for the DPA, Office of Legal Affairs in Oakland, that's the Drug Policy Alliance, the nonprofit who is one of our allies and allies of many. And she was named High Times Freedom Fighter of the Month. Mm -hmm. That's in 2001. So then, Ellen moves to Humboldt County in 2002, <laughs> right? where she worked for the Civil Liberties Monitoring Project in Garberville, yes, and sat on the Humboldt County, Humboldt County Medical Marijuana Task Force, resulting in a county ordinance to implement SB 420, an important piece of legislation. Somewhere along the way, Ellen got a BS in biochemistry from Penn State. She worked in advertising and publishing in LA, and she's contributed articles and op-eds to various publications, and this is kind of a who's who of publications in the cannabis world. High Times, In These Times, Alternate, O'Shaughnessy's, California Normal Report, The Eureka Times Standard, and Cannabis Culture. Ellen uh, recently published a book, which is one of my favorite books about women in cannabis, called Token Women, A 4,000-Year-Old History, and I think she just sold out of copies in the corner. Ah, there's one of them. It's a really great book and it makes an excellent Christmas gift. <laughs> the book is an enlightening compilation of over 50 famous females throughout her story, associated with cannabis from ancient goddesses to bohemian authors, jazz musicians, and icons of the 1960s to the film goddesses of today. Welcome, Ellen Comp. Well, I almost feel like that was my own 4,000 year history. No wonder I'm tired. Okay. Thanks a lot, Anne, for all your support for my project. Um, okay. Uh, oh, here it is. Oops, jumping ahead here. Let me jump back. Oh wow, that's really, <coughs> sorry about that. Uh, start at the beginning. <clears throat> uh, <gasps> How'd that get in there? Jeff Sessions, who I also hope will be a footnote very soon in history. Um, one of his quotes is, good people don't smoke marijuana. And uh, Al Franken 
I think would beg to differ at this point. Uh, and I beg to differ on other grounds because of the information that I've gathered for my book, Token Women. Uh, it starts with the goddess Ishtar, who's uh, why we celebrate Easter these days. And she was also associated with an aromatic herb that uh, was cannabis back as far as 2300 BCE. Uh, as well as mythological evidence, we also have archaeological evidence. This uh, Siberian ice princess was found in Russia. She's, her, she's dated back to 1500 BCE. She's uh, tattooed in such a manner that makes it clear she was some kind of shamaness. And she was buried with all kinds of things, several uh, saddled horses, all kinds of beautiful things, and a container of cannabis. <laughs> we also have evidence in, the, in Egypt, the goddess Seshat, she of the seven points, is always depicted with this seven-pointed leaf headdress above her head. And she also participated in the stretching the rope ceremonies to build the Egyptian pyramids where hemp rope was stretched in the way that you would lay a cornerstone today for the building of the Great Pyramids. I think you can make a case that the, some of the spices that the Queen of Sheba brought to Solomon were also cannabis. Uh, the Rastafarians have been singing about this for a long time. Whether she came from uh, Africa or the Middle East, I think it's quite possible. Uh, in the East, Helen, or in the West, Helen of Troy, uh, she was the purveyor of the Nepenthe, right? And this is what she gave to warriors to let them forget the, the horrors of the battle. Um, some think that Nepenthe included several herbs, including marijuana or cannabis. And uh, today, warriors will tell you that, in fact, it does help them forget the horrors of battle. In the East, the goddess Pavarti, the consort of the Lord Shiva, uh, by some legends, discovered the cannabis plant and shared it with Shiva, much in the way that Eve shared the now forbidden fruit with Adam, uh, after which they invented Tantra Yoga together. <laughs> to this day, uh, to celebrate their wedding, uh, bong, a drink made with cannabis, is drunk in parts of India. Just happened last week, actually. Uh, the Chinese goddess Magu, Ma meaning hemp, this, she is known as the hemp maiden, and for her harvest celebration, uh, that celebrates the time when the world was green and cannabis was harvested. Then we had the Bible come along, and uh, we had Princess Jezebel, who was a devotee of the ancient god Bel, uh, married to Ishtar's mother, Astarte, and to her, incense was burned to worship her. And some think, including the archaeologist, archaeologist Sula Bennett, a woman, uh, that that incense, cannabosum, was cannabis, and that it's been mistranslated in modern Bibles as cannabis. Since it means the fragrant cane, it stands to reason to me that it was, in fact, cannabis. But in the Bible, prophet after prophet warns of doom upon the Israelis if they continue to burn incense to Astarte and the god Bel. And um, Jezebel was a devotee of Bel, and she was, you know, she and Ahab, her husband, were exiled. And to this day, Jezebel is, you know, an uh, evil, fallen woman in our modern patriarchal iconography, right? Um, Yet, cannabis survived and was used by various, um, various women. Um, a recent discovery was a Viking ship that was dated back to 820 AD that had two women on it. One was age 50, one was age 70. They had these magic wands with them and all kinds of stuff, ornately carved sleighs and beds, tapestries, clothing, and a small leather pouch containing cannabis seeds. Uh, so we don't see much about it in writing until we come up to Hildegard von Bingen. She was a visionary nun in uh, 1100 AD who 
She corresponded with all the great leaders of the day, including the Pope. She wrote all kinds of things, operas and books, and, and two herbal uh, books. Uh, one uh, talked about hemp to use against nodes, winds, and other heart tumors. Kind of like today. Uh, this is the cover of my book. It's a 1834 painting by Eugène Delacroix, a French painter who traveled to Egypt, uh, as did many of the uh, European swells of the time. This is after Napoleon had invaded Egypt in 1800 and his soldiers discovered cannabis. So this is a way that the West rediscovered the cannabis that had been sort of um, hidden in the Eastern world for lo the many years of the witch burnings and that sort of thing. <laughs> Uh, so a lot of um, men went to the harems of the East and they discovered the women smoking hashish and opium and, and uh, tried it themselves. And a lot of women did too, uh, one of whom was uh, Harriet Martineau, who was the great, 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 great grandmother of Princess Kate in England. She was the first sociologist and she also tried cannabis there. And another was Gertrude Bell, who is pictured here between Winston Churchill and Lawrence of Arabia in front of a sphinx. Um, she helped draw the uh, modern boundaries of Iraq. She uh, was an aristocratic English woman who went all around the East with a big entourage, and she enjoyed the Nargola pipe. Good people don't smoke. Um, <laughs> Also, then, you know, now that it had come east and it was available in pharmacies and it was shown at the Turkic, Turkish Exposition in uh, the World's Fair in New York in the late 1800s, Louisa May Alcott, the author of Little Women, uh, wrote two stories in which hashish figured as part of the plot. Uh, I don't know for sure whether she took it, but her description is extremely vivid. <laughs> Uh, and then we had the, uh, so then, you know, artists and bohemians and musicians uh, embraced it as uh, we know it uh, is helpful in the creative process, correct? And uh, one was Bessie Smith, who was quite a phenomenon, the blues singer. Um, she was known as a symbol of personal freedom. She sang about uh, reefer in a song in 1933, Give Me a Reefer, she says. One of the white women at the time who was uh, open about using it was uh, Tallulah Bankhead, who was uh, the daughter of an Alabama senator who became an actress and was a very much a show business personality. Her famous quote, or one of them, was, I'm the foe of moderation, the champion of excess. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> there was a famous trial in which a, uh, one of her underlings was said that part of his job was to roll her joints. <laughs> Why did they call him that? I don't know. Um, I think that Tallulah might have been the model for this cartoon that came out in 1937, the year that the Marijuana Tax Act all but made marijuana illegal in the United States. Here, a, a woman, you know, marijuana personified as a woman is being literally kicked out of a drugstore by a federal inspector and she's there on the street where, you know, the street drug happens, so. So then women did start to get arrested for marijuana, um, like the jazz singer Anita O'Day, for example, and another was Lila Leeds, who was a 20-year-old starlet, rather a looker, who uh, was arrested with Robert Mitchum in 1948 for marijuana, and while Mitchum's career survived because he was well known. Lila never made another movie except for the horrible Reefer Madness style movie titled She Should Have Said No. <laughs> I think the 1951 cover of the Pulp Fiction novel Marijuana Girl rather resembles Lila, kind of a wholesome looking blonde. But by 1960, Marijuana Girl's hair had darkened and she'd become almost demonic looking and can hardly keep her clothes on and has all kinds of salacious copy on the cover too, so. <laughs> Look how we've been, you know, much like, uh, the, actually the goddess Ishtar was sexualized in the Gilgamesh myth, the first myth of the day and to this day, you know, 
to de denigrate a woman is to over-sexualize her, right? But then the 70s happened, or the 60s happened, and we got, you know, rock and rollers singing the praises of marijuana, using it openly, talking about it, singing about it, and Grace Slick, I chose as the one to represent that because of, you know, she went back to the 1860s where uh, Lewis Carroll took us all down the rabbit hole with the hookah-smoking ca caterpillar, back to White Rabbit, feed your head. <laughs> And at the same time, Margaret Mead, the anthropologist, came out and testified before Congress saying it was her opinion marijuana is not harmful unless taken in excessive amount, enormous and excessive amounts. So we had, um, you know, the intelligentsia on our side as well. The 60s really started to break things open. And then there was this lady. <laughs> I just uh, threw a WCVC, found this wonderful photo of her that I got to. Um, use and uh, she uh, in 1965 when Ken Kesey was arrested for marijuana at the time when you know it was considered a horribly immoral thing to do reportedly said to the press I'm not weeping with remorse <laughs> and that was actually a very uh, radical thing to say in 1965 and uh, researching her I just found out that you know, yes this um, book that she wrote, Primo Plant, which is my favorite grow book. It's just got, it's beautifully written. It's got everything you really need to know. Um, that was very instrumental in bringing back the whole sensimia craze among the back to the landers and so much that we uh, benefit from today. So she's, she belongs in here. And then in the 60s, we started, started seeing you know, cultural references as well to marijuana. So 1968, a year before Easy Rider, you know, which is always cited as the first appearance of marijuana in film, we had I Love You, Alice B. Toklas, in which Leigh Taylor Young played a uh, hippie girl who turns Peter Sellers on to Alice B. Toklas brownies. I don't have Alice in here, uh, but yes, in her cookbook, she famously published a story about, uh, I mean, a recipe for hashish fudge. She was uh, Gertrude Stein's lover, and they had wonderful salons in Paris. And even the TV show Bewitched had a reference to Alice B. Topless Brown at one point. And Nora asks, when someone offers her cookies, they're not any chance from an Alice B. Topless recipe. And the straight grandma says, well, no. And she says, oh, well, then never mind. <laughs> And also on TV at this time, Lee French was doing her bit on this Mother's Brothers show where she did Share a Little Tea with Goldie that always started with, I'd like to greet you ladies as I usually do. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> and she'd have them send her unsightly roaches to her and things like that, and it was a wonderful skit. Um, this movie from 1971 I loved where Harold and Maude, she's an 80-year-old woman who sort of breathe life into this uh, troubled young man, in part by sharing a hookah with him. And then in 1977, we had Annie Hall, a movie which won every Academy Award and uh, was basically the story of a pothead. Annie <laughs> 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 Hall. <clears throat> and also at the time, famous women were using marijuana in the 70s. Uh, Maya Angelou wrote about it in the sequel to I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings. She wrote, I lost myself in a haze of sensual pleasure. She said it, it enhanced her experience of eating, dancing, and parenting. Joan Rivers recently invite, uh, admitted that she uh, smoked it with Betty White and other people back in the 70s. We had fun, she said. <laughs> Barbara Streisand used to joke about it on the stage, you know, take, take hits, and uh, I'm pretty sure she smoked it. <laughs> then come into the 1980s, which started with a really cool movie, 9 to 5, where Jane Fonda plays the innocent who gets high, uh, along with Dolly Parton and Lily Tomlin. There's a really great scene with Lily Tomlin, actually, and her son in the movie. And, um, and then they plot to uh, overtake their company from their horrible boss and succeed, actually. So really a radical movie. And actually started, helped form the, uh, the union SEIU, this movie, 9 to 5. 
And then this lady came along. <laughs> <laughs> I use the term loosely. Um, yeah, we had such a backlash in the 80s on so many things. I mean, uh, I didn't work in reform till 91, but um, we weren't even on the page with it. You know, it was this lockstep drug war when I first entered the movement all those years ago. No one really questioned it. It was almost like a religion. And um, from the most simplistic kind of statements like, just say no. But then, we had the breakthrough of medical marijuana. And in the 90s, AIDS activists started activating for the use of all kinds of medicines, ACT and, and also cannabis. And Brownie Mary, who, if you don't know, was a very well-known activist in San Francisco who would bake brownies for AIDS patients and take them around. And she was quite an effective spokesperson. As Dennis Brown used to say, she could cry on a dime. She was great. <laughs> But she really did feel it. She was just a little old lady baking brownies with her raised fist. And uh, I mean, I could put so many activists in here, but I chose a few to represent. Uh, you know, Valerie Corral, uh, yeah, spoken at a lot of these events. Um, she founded the Women's Alliance for Medical Marijuana in Santa Cruz. It's the model on which we base the whole cooperative model that ended up in SB 420 and is the reason that we have cooperatives. It changed into something a little bit different kind of right after that, but it, hers was a true cooperative where the patients all tended the plants together, they owned the plants together and healed, and she took on the federal government, or they took on her, and she succeeded, starting with, they couldn't even leave the, the farm because the patients had gathered and were blocking the gate after the raid. So, she's a heroine. A shiro, as they say. And another one, of course, is LV Musica, who's one of the few remaining patients who still receives medical marijuana from the federal government under a program that was started in the 70s. She's a glaucoma patient, and uh, she's also a very effective spokesperson. And boy, she smokes pot all day, and she has more energy than anybody I've ever met. She's, she's really an amazing woman. And then again, this started getting reflected in the culture where then we had Murphy Brown, or Candace Bergen as Murphy Brown, uh, on TV as a medical marijuana user in 1997. This was, uh, you know, controversial at the time. She was controversial for a lot of reasons and uh, started opening the floodgates. We had the British movie Saving Grace about a woman growing pot to save the farm in 2000, which was kind of the precursor to the TV show Weeds, where the woman did, except she forgot to smoke pot herself. I never really got that about her. Um, other thing, Polly Bergen was on Desperate Housewives, uh, saying to her daughter suffering from chemo, perhaps a visit from my old friend Mary Jane. Mm -hmm. You know, and other, other things like that. Um, and then, again, now the floodgates really started opening. Women really started feeling free to talk about it. Jennifer Aniston was still everybody's favorite girl next door in Friends when in 2001 she told Rolling Stone, I enjoy it once in a while, there's nothing wrong with that, everything in moderation. Notice, unlike Tallulah Bankhead of old, she's a fan of moderation, so things have kind of <laughs> moved in a different direction there. And yeah, she seems to be doing quite fine with it all. Um, Nora Jones has come out and saying, she's not a pothead, that's something else Aniston said, they don't like to call themselves that, but, uh, but she doesn't have a problem with the munchies. Um, and then women start talking about what it does for them. Alanis Morissette has come out and said, you know, as an artist, there's a jump-starting quality to it for me. Uh, so the creative aspects of it are starting to be talked about. Um, actress Kirsten Dunn said, if everybody smoked weed, the world would be a better place. Right? I mean, come on. Um, the meme queen, Dr. Susan Blackmore, said without cannabis, most of her scientific research would never have been done. And she writes about how it inspires her. Um, Melissa Etheridge talked about how she doesn't want to look like a criminal to her children anymore as a marijuana smoker, and that's something important. I want them to know this is a choice that you make as a responsible adult. Susan Sarandon has also come out and said, I'd rather my kids smoke weed except, than drink, except that it's illegal. Uh, 
Whoopi Goldberg has now become quite the spokesperson. Now she has a, her line, Whoopi and Maya, which is uh, for women's menstrual problems. Uh, she was kind of outed by TMZ, uh, admitting that she was high when she accepted her award for Ghost. And if you look at the, the uh, speech that she gave, it's like the most sincere speech. She thanked everyone in the industry that she'd ever known. It was so beautiful. Uh, and, but she also has quite a platform, you know, and has been able to talk about it in a lot of places. She writes a column for the Denver Post about it. Uh, Rosie Barr came out and was ran for president partly on a uh, platform to legalize marijuana. She appeared at Oaksterdam University and she understands the psychological aspects of this. The war on drugs is waged by, waged by rich people on prescription drugs against poor people on street drugs. <coughs> that says a lot. I mean, even Martha Stewart now is hanging out with Snoop Dogg. <laughs> and it's funny, you know, Martha Stewart actually got radicalized when she went to prison, you know, on some kind of lame stock charge, right? Nothing like most people get away with. And uh, her letter from prison that year was all about how we should end the drug war because she had met so many women in prison who were in prison for drugs. Even Oprah Winfrey recently admitted, you know, she smoked it until 1982. Uh, let's hang out after the show, the host says. Okay, I hear it's gotten better. <laughs> <laughs> Lady Gaga said this about, uh, she smoked a huge slip on stage and it changed my life and cut down on drinking, which is important if you think about Amy Winehouse, right? Um, then she came out and said that she was addicted to it. And Jeff Sessions seized on that recently and said, well, even Lady Gaga, which is really funny, like who knew Jeff Sessions knew who Lady Gaga was? <laughs> he says, oh, you know, well, it, it's, it's addictive because Lady Gaga says so. But then I looked into it and it turns out that that time period where Lady Gaga was overusing it, she had fallen from the stage and she was using it medicinally. Uh, and she said shortly after that, you know, I like marijuana, it makes me feel like I'm 17 again, which does not seem like a bad thing to me. <laughs> Miley Cyrus, I had, to, I had to include Myra. She's been a controversial person, but I mean, she actually does a lot of good works. This is her standing on the stage at the European MTV Awards and lighting a joint. This, this moment was actually censored from US TV. I was able to get a picture of it with the help of Leon Eliminate, who sponsored me for that. And uh, she's made a lot of good statements about it. She turns 25 this year, so <laughs> we spam the whole generation now. So now, now we've got all kinds of actresses smoking it in private and on the screen. Kirsten Stewart, Anne Hathaway, Cameron Diaz, Drew Marymore. The movie The Women had Meg Ryan smoking it, although you have to go to the uh, deleted scenes to see her say, I'm really stoned. But, but in this movie, after she smokes it, and this is a remake of an old movie by Claire Booth Luce, uh, she, after she smokes it, and so often happens, then, then they find their way to their center and their real meaning of life and all of that. And, you know, why can't we accept that, you know, used judiciously and in, with intention and everything, that it does have that power and that uh, helpfulness as a plant ally. It's starting to, it's starting to be depicted on film. Um, this Meryl Streep appeared in this movie. It was rated R because there was pot smoking, quote, without negative consequences. <laughs> so this is what we've been up against as far as the censors go. Uh, you know, Mad Men had it, Sex in the City, Gossip Girl had it, even Carol Burnett appeared on Hawaii Five O. She bought some pot in a Hawaiian uh, dispensary. I needed some grass, those fascists at the dispensary wouldn't take my car. <laughs> And then Helen Hunt came out last year with this really cool film, Ride, where she plays a woman who learns to surf and smoke pot. And uh, this is interesting to me because she appeared in 1980 and uh, she was in that TV show uh, where Charlotte Ray was the house mother and it was a, it was a very clean show where... Facts of life. The Facts of Life, thank you. And she does a book report on Moby Dick, which is funny because I think Moby Dick is full of him. But she's, she's unable to write it because she's stoned. And uh, Charlotte Ray gives her, you know, advice and all of this stuff. And now we found out afterwards that the uh, drug czar's office was actually paying networks to put out 
TV shows with anti-drug messages, right? And that was probably one of them. Well, now Helen. So thanks everybody for um, listening, and um, I don't know if anyone has questions, but uh, okay. we've got time for a few questions or comments or. Anyway, I forgot. These are just really representative samplings. And I, I hope to do more writing. I, I put the book out with just kind of s summaries almost of the research I've been doing, thinking, well, nobody reads anymore, right? But everybody's been saying, well, I really want to read more, you know? So um, there's more at the, my website, Token, uh, Token Woman, my, my blog, where I tell kind of fuller stories if you really want to do some reading. Yeah. Thank you. Um, just a quick question, in writing your book, in the process of writing it, um, were there one or two big lessons that you learned or were surprises that, or surprises to you in the writing process that you didn't expect to learn or were, um, were the most impactful to you? Well, you know, I've been trying to come up with a thesis, like how did it all happen, you know, it's like, to, to me, it's the subjugation of women was hand in hand with the subjugation of herbal medicines, you know. And there are so many reasons why that happened. And and you know, uh, I mentioned uh, Ishtar becoming denigrated as a um, sexualized goddess, and that also happened around the time when war just became sort of the religion. And so you. We came away from, uh, I don't know, enjoying every, anything and, and turning everything into a war machine. And we're so steeped in it now. We're just in a, a constant warlike mentality now. I mean, interviewers have started to call me this month because it's Women's Month. And now oh, we're doing the story about women in the industry in Canada and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I say, well, you know, to me, I think it transcends. It's way beyond just women getting involved in the industry. I think if we really start connecting with our history, as I call it, and understanding that um, this is a political thing that happened to us, that it, this was taken away from us as our ally, as our medicine, and you know, Stacy's um, piece, uh, presentation was great about, you know, how it was helpful for uh, pregnancy, etc. cetera. Um, I see us getting much more radical about it, and cause we've got so much to change, you know, it isn't, just about putting on the pussy hat that time and, you know, <laughs> going out there. I mean, the, the fact that anybody like that could get elected in this day and age, someone who's so disrespectful of women, is, um, you know, really gave me pause. I mean, I didn't even go out and celebrate when we legalized marijuana finally. I couldn't get off the couch that night, you know? And, because um, I thought I was going to see my first woman elected and marijuana legal. And, Nothing like that happened, and so um, now I feel like I have two jobs because after my job, I spend the rest of the day looking at what Trump did that day, you know, and how it impacts so many things, the environment and families and everything. And um, so it's a great time to, to bring it all together. Like I'm from the days when, you know, everybody marched at all the marches, the civil rights, the, you know, women's rights, environmental, and it was all fueled by marijuana. <laughs> So uh, I, I, I want to see those times come back, and they, they better happen fast. Back to the 60s. Yeah, baby. <laughs> so I guess that will be on that note. Thanks.